We'll talk to you private, are you not motivated? Do we need to get motivated? Friendly rest position! Move! What kind of push-ups are that, private? Whoa, whoa. Are you motivated? Calm, calm down. This is educational psychology. Let's think the classroom now. Hi, my name is Jessica Flowers, and I'm here to talk to you about motivational theories and psychology. Motivation and educational psychology. Just to give you a run through, I'm going to be talking about what is motivation, some theories and approaches to motivation in psychology, um, the influences of needs in motivational learning, the influence of beliefs in motivational learning, the influence of goals, and the influence of interest and emotions. I'm also going to be giving some examples of what motivational learning looks like in a classroom setting at the end of the day. Okay, so what is motivation? Motivation is defined as the process whereby a goal-directed activity is instigated and sustained. And of course, in educational psychology, we are concerned mostly with what's going to keep a student focused, what's going to motivate the students, and what's going to want, make them want to focus in the classroom, and what's going to keep them succeeding academically. So let me go in to start explaining the difference between extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation that you can see on the uh, left there is motivation that comes from within the individual. And extrinsic motivation, the one in the blue on the right, is motivation that comes from factors outside of the individual. Now, what does this look like? So when a person is intrinsically motivated, they have a sense of achievement, they have a sense of curiosity about them, they're interested in the subject that they're learning about, and um, they have that overall sense of pride. But when they're extrinsically motivated, they're worried about things like money, grades, their career, things that are important, but things that are driven by environmental factors and not by factors from within themselves. But we can see how both factors are very important for motivating an individual. So next I'm going to start talking about the different psychological approaches to motivation. The first one I'm going to talk about is the behavioral approach. The behavioral approach focuses on visible changes that they can see in behavior that result from experiences in the environment. Specifically experiences such as rewards and punishments that would either increase or decrease a behavior, and this is known as um, operant conditioning. Now the next one you need to know is the humanistic approach. And the humanistic approach believes that humans are inherently good and in striving to reach their full potential. So motivation is driven by this desire to fulfill their uh, true potential as human beings. And the humanistic approach is a very developed theory about motivation that I will get more into later. But after that, next is the cognitive and social cognitive approach. The social cognitive approach takes into consideration more factors such as, and the social cognitive takes um, expectations and beliefs into consideration when understanding motivation. Uh, and the self-efficacy theory is a theory in the social cognitive approach that is a um, very developed theory that I'll be talking about more so later. But lastly, we have the sociocultural theory, which emphasizes individual participation in communities and deals with value and factors such as race and um, socioeconomic status and gender, along with other um, social factors when it comes to what's going to contribute to motivation. All right, so those are the four major branches and now I'm going to start talking about the influence of needs on motivational. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the influence of needs on motivations to learn. So all of the need theories are humanistic, and they were created by Maslow. The first one is his hierarchy of needs. And this hierarchy of needs was this idea that people needed to um, overcome their physical needs, their need for safety, and all of these innate human needs, and they would reach um, self-actualization. This was the idea of reaching their full potential that I talked about earlier in humanism. He also believed that every single human had the want for self-determination. In the self-determination theory, um, he assumes that people want to have 
choices and they want to make decisions and that this is motivating to them. He assumes um, in this theory that all people have these three innate psychological needs, and that's competence, they want to be autonomous, and they need it to be able to be related to um, in order to have self-determination and accomplish those basic needs. He also thought that people had this idea that they need to preserve their self-worth or their self-esteem. It's another word for it. Um, and this wanting to preserve their self-esteem is so strong that it is a very motivating factor. So now we're going to talk about the influence of beliefs on motivations and learning. So beliefs we're going to talk about are beliefs about future outcomes, intelligence, capacity, value, and the causes of performance. And the first one we're going to talk about is the expectancy value theory, and that has to do with beliefs about future outcomes. And that theory states that a learner will be motivated to the uh, engage in a task to the extent that they expect they're going to succeed on that task times the value they place on that success. So then the next belief is about intelligence. We have the entity view of intelligence and the incremental view of intelligence. The entity view of intelligence believes that intelligence is fixed and this belief can lead to learned helplessness, while the incremental view of intelligence believes more that in, um, intelligence is caused by hard work and factors like that. The next belief has to do with self-efficacy. And self-efficacy is the belief that one can complete a task, that someone can do something. And the belief that the student can complete the task is influenced by things such as past performance, modeling, verbal persuasion, and their psychological state at the time. Now, learners with high self-efficacy are more willing to take risks, accept challenges, push themselves, and they believe they're going to succeed and they typically have better results, where people with lower self-efficacy avoid challenges and they give up quicker and it just causes lower motivation. So now let's talk about some values and how they affect motivation. Now, now values refer to the benefits, rewards, or advantages that an individual experience from participating in an activity. And the attribution theory falls under this category because it's a theory that deals with um, a learner's belief about the causes of their success and their failures and how these beliefs are going to influence their motivation. These things exist on a three-dimensional scale. They have a locus, um, sustainability, and control that we have to look at. And the locus has to do with things such as, is this inside or outside of the learner's control? The stability of the situation, is it a stable or unstable? and if the learner has any control or not control in the situation. If they don't, this can also lead to learned helplessness. Uh, but the next thing we're going to talk about goals could help overcome this, and we're going to focus on mastery goals, which has to do with um, mastering a skill or task, performance goals, which is wanting, say, to like, be the best in the class, Performance avoidance goals, which is trying to avoid a particular uncomfortable situation like public speaking. Um, social goals, trying to have people see them in a good you know, light. And work avoidance goals, trying to complete an assignment without you know, as much effort as possible. And these goals um, go into the goal theory, where the learner's behavior towards the goal is going to be enforced by one of these five specific things. And the goal theory then goes into goal setting and goal monitoring and strategy use in order to complete those goals. After that, we have interest and how that affects motivation. We have personal interest, which is whether or not a person has an affinity or an attraction to something. And we have situational interest, which is a person's current enjoyment in a certain situation. So it's kind of like a fleeting uh, in the moment interest. And then, of course, emotions such as guilt, shame, anxiety, pride are going to help increase or decrease a student's motivation at the time. So now that we've talked about all these theories, we can kind of look at a classroom and see that if we apply theories like humanism, we can help increase the students feeling that they're involved in the class and that'll help increase their motivation. If we apply 
goal setting theories that will help the students stay on task and keep them motivated to try and complete their goals. If we use the um, value theory to try and help the students see the value of their hard work and we have to look at beliefs and see what the students are believing about themselves and help them increase their self efficacy so they know that they can complete a task based on hard work and not just because they can't do it. So all of these theories help to increase a learner's motivation, specifically a student's motivation, and that's why they're so important to educational psychology. Thank you very much. Have a great day.